If you have your Bibles with you, I'd ask you to turn to 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6. Uh, while you're turning there, I always request prayer as your pastor. Uh, I love it, but it's not the easiest thing to do and to tell people the truth. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6. We're going to begin reading. We're just going to read two verses for our text. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Paul says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which is which you have of God, and ye are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify body, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Dear Lord, we thank you for your blessed word. We thank you for your goodness and your watch care. We thank you uh, for this church. Lord, we pray that you allow us to stand faithful in a very strange day. God, help us to be a witness to others, to have compassion on the lost. We be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it's in Christ's name that we, we do pray. Amen. Now, here are some fairly familiar verses of Scripture. And if you know the church at Corinth, it had gotten in a mess. And there was a lot of junk going on in the church, even to the point of a man having a relationship with his stepmother. And nobody had ever said, hey, we can't do this. Nobody had ever said, uh, we're going in the wrong direction. Nobody had ever said any of those things. And so Paul writes them a very scathing letter, but that's not my emphasis this morning. In verse 19 again, uh, we'll... Uh, will uh, review the verses and he says what now what he had just reviewed was the filth of the flesh of the things that we are naturally drawn to and it, it never ceases to amaze me that i've been saved for over 40 years and i still have those inclinations that is because this flesh is still alive. You know, some people are fearful for dying. In one sense, I look forward to it because this thing will finally be put away. And I won't have to deal with it anymore. And, and so he, he says, <laughs> he reminds them of all the inabilities and the draws of the flesh. And then he says this, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? And, and you know, that's something that should really get our attention uh, uh -huh. is that God, will, God dwells within us. And so where we go, He goes. And what we do, uh, He's privy to. That we are filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, that's one reason that's not real popular teaching today is the Pentecostals have taken it from us. But listen, filled with the Holy Ghost is not popping around on the ground acting like a crazy person. Being filled with the Holy Ghost is His holiness on us, and the gift of that is leadership. Uh, he will give you leadership if you ask for it. And the Holy Ghost will, will direct you in the way that you ought to go. So Paul gives the Corinthian believers a reminder and say, hey, He's in you. You're, you're taking the Holy Ghost through trash. And then he says, which is, in, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own. Now that's the one that really uh, gigs us, especially as American people. Uh, we uh, take pride in our freedom. <coughs> And it has been a preserver of the gospel for nearly 300 years. But that, that freedom has almost given us an aversion to what we are as Christian, and that's slaves. We, we don't want to view ourselves under the dominion of anybody. 
That, that's one thing that people have an issue with the sovereignty of God and that he says whom seemeth good to do himself is because we want to say, hey, I'm saved because I say I'm saved. Right? I accepted Jesus. He didn't accept me because I'm good. That, that's the nature that freedom has given us. And again, it, it's a wondrous, wondrous gift. I think we're losing a little bit of it every day, but it is a gift of God. But don't let it go to your head. Don't, don't, don't let it be something that you find a pride in, because in reality, if you've been born again, you are a slave. You were bought. You were uh, 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 you were purchased at a at a very high price, and that's what we're going to look at today is your purchase price. Amen. And you're not your own. That's right. You 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 don't belong to yourself, and, and that's not popular preaching today. Uh, slavery is one of those uh, one of those things we almost avoid. But slavery is a reality. It's still a reality today. We'd like to believe that it's not, but it is. Uh, there are many countries that still have slavery. And, and you see young people sold, uh, sell, sold on the black market. You know, uh, I don't know where the government begins or ends, but one of Donna's uh, responsibilities as a midwife is to register those births. Now, this is the reality. Not all births are registered. And if they're not registered, that person doesn't exist, and you can do with them whatever you want to. Yeah. Now that 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 is the reality, and, and, and so we see then we are not we we are bought with a price, the price of the precious blood of Jesus, and so if we are in fact an owned object, we're a slave, right? But we are slaves to the person of Christ. Verse 20, for ye are bought with a price. You are purchased. It was the blood of Christ. It was his, his, his beautiful life. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Amen. Now, he, he bought the full package. When, when me and Donna bought that double wide, we just didn't, we just didn't buy the exterior. We had the interior too. So he bought your body. And he bought your spirit, and they both shall be you should be used simultaneously to serve God. Now, a lot of those teachings are not pleasant uh, to the to the ear in the modern day. Uh, Don and I visited a church one time where uh, uh, Kenny was preaching, and I, I was like amazed they even invited him because I, I I knew the church well, and I I, I even repeated to him. And let it let him repeat it back to me like you do an old person. Because I was like, Kenny, why are these people having you to preach? And well, they like me. But end up, I was right. <laughs> and uh, he wasn't sure he was going to get out of there alive. But Don and I visited him uh, on the second run, and um, talk, and, and we knew the pastor, the old pastor's wife. And I don't have any hot, hard feelings of them. <laughs> They do what they know to do. All I can say is that the Lord has not revealed his sovereignty to them. But one statement she made to Donna, well, things are not like they used to be. We, we can't preach on separation. Well, it's not that you can't. It's that you won't. Mm -hmm. And you know why people don't preach on separation today? They're worried about how many folks they can keep in the pews. Right. But listen, dear friend, you're bought with a price. It's not, it's not up to me, it's up to you. A slave has to do as he is told. And that, that's not popular preaching, is it? In other words, if, if your master says, jump, your only question is, how high? What, would, how high would you, what kind of force do you want me to push, put into that jump? But there's not one of us under the sound of my voice this morning that really puts that much care into the service of the Lord. And, and you're like, well, why should I? Well, I'm going to show you why you should in very specific detail. 
I'm going to show you the price that he paid. If you go with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, and I've preached this, and you're hearing many times down through the years, but we always need to hear it again, because sometimes we forget the horrific abuse that our Jesus suffered on our behalf just to, just to buy us back and to make us pure again and, 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 to loot, and, and to remove the damnation to hell. Right. Matthew 27, and we're going to begin reading in verse 4. Matthew 27, excuse me, verse 24. Matthew 27, verse 24. The Bible says, When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, now, what he was trying to do, Pilate, I mean, was to go on behalf of Jesus and say, don't kill him, kill Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was the nature of the flesh. Barabbas was evil inside and out. He was a murderer. He was against the government. He was a thief. Any kind of name that you want to put on him, that was Barabbas. You know who that also is? That's you. And that's me. And, and, and everyone that is born in the flesh, deep down, that's who we are. Uh, I've often read uh, about Charles Manson and his group. And you think, how could someone go so far? Well, that's who we are. That's what we consist of. And, and you know, something interesting and I'll give this as an extra for you. You know, Charles Manson never killed anyone. Did you know that? But he had people killed for him. He could manipulate people. And, and, and so we find, you're like, and, and, and I don't even remember his name, but there was another guy that killed like, had like 34 people buried under his house. How can people get there? We, everyone, have it in us. That's not popular teaching, but we do. If you've not been born again, that is our nature. And, and, and so we see then that as uh, Matthew's recording the gospel, he, he makes mention of Pilate's situation. When Pilate, Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather atonement was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude multitude saying I am innocent of the blood of this just person see you to it now I want you to call your attention to uh, that he said the more he but that atonement was made now atonement is uh, is a fight atonement is an argument atonement is an upsetting of a group of individuals you know what people want to do today they want to avoid atonement they, they don't want to upset the apple cart. You go somewhere and, pre and preach, they want you to say this, that, and the other. The only time that um, I've ever said, told somebody to go preach for them and then called them back and said no was uh, there was a boy that preached in that church that Jared pastored in Paris, and he, and he took the pastor down, and he goes, I want you to come preach a meeting for me. And I said, okay. I said, I think I could do that and look at my work schedule. He said, but I don't want you to preach like you usually preach. And I said, I can't come. <laughs> and I said, I won't come. And the reason why, he, he, he loved the doctrines of grace. And he loved Bible truth or part of Bible truth. But he says, you, you preach on separation too much. And we don't want to hear it. <laughs> you know, one thing I'd say for this man is at least he's honest. <laughs> right? I mean, you can criticize him in a lot of ways, but I've been to other churches and preached, and, and deep down I think they felt the same way. And, and so we find here, we in 2023, we want to avoid the torment. But dear friend, let me, let me assure you of this. That is an impossibility if you stand for truth. There will be a torment made. 
And so we see that Pilate is a compromiser. He, he jumped right in with him and said, okay. And then he went to a ceremonial washing of the hands and he was done with it. But that did not help his spiritual situation. Verse 25, then answered all the people and said, his blood be on us and on our children. That was the Jews. And uh, sometimes I'm mystified that more, more Jewish people don't see Christ for who he is. This is why. Can you imagine giving your curse to your children deliberately? That's exactly what was going on here. Why many Jews today, there are few and far, uh, few and far Jews that believe that Jesus is the Christ. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he, meaning Pilate, had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Now, two things in this verse. First of all, what do you think Barabbas is going to do when he gets out? You know what he's going to do? He's going to do exactly what Barabbas has always done because Barabbas' nature hasn't been changed. So they were setting their own self up for robbery. They were setting their own self up uh, for their things to be stole from them. And they preferred that. Is that not amazing that people preferred, preferred to be hurt in such a way? Well, no, not really. We all prefer it. We, 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 if we had a choice, it would always be bent towards sin. So they let Barabbas go. And then I want you to see the next thing in that, <coughs> that, uh, remember how Pilate said, his blood, you know, his blood be on you. And then he turns around two verses later and beats the Lord himself. Now, listen, this is where we begin to get in the punishment for, of Christ on our behalf. Now, many times we read through these verses and don't blink an eye, but that ought not to be so. This scourging, I think it's referred to as scourging in the Gospel of Luke, was a beating that was unmerciful. It was the 39 stripes that Paul received five times. It was a beating with, with a cat of nine tails, which was a whip, and it, it went out to uh, nine different lengths, and on those lengths was impregnated with bone and rock and steel. So when you did like this and came back, you took everything with you. Most people died before the 39 stripes were complete. You know what preserved Christ? It was because the blood had not been given yet. You know what preserved Paul? The goodness of God. Mm -hmm. that, that was the preservation. Listen, dear friend, if you're saved, that's your purchase price. That, that's what he gave on your behalf. That's how he bought you. That's, right. that, that's how he accomplished the purchase. And so we see a horrific beating that can only be understood by the Jews at that time and the Romans. And, and again, you know, I've even read sometimes the, one, one of your major organs, that the most dense, heavy organ you have is your liver, and it's located about right here that their liver would fall out of their back. Yeah. You know what? That, that's just horrific. He did that for me. <laughs> Why would, I, why would I withhold anything from him if he did that for me? And it, it, it amazes me, you know, that people elect to do the other. So he has this horrific beating from somebody who supposedly liked him. Verse 27, then the soldiers of the governor uh, took Jesus unto the common hall <laughs> and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers, and they stripped him. Now, if you remember what he was wearing was a very nice coat that had been given to him. We're not sure, we just know that he didn't buy it. And they stripped him of his authority. You know, uh, y'all don't get to see me this very much. Well, my family does, but the Andersons don't. You know, when I go to work, 
I look totally different. I usually wear blue or red scrubs, and I don't look like a preacher. I look like a nurse. And you know, that's why when I go into the nursing home, the residents knows who's whose. It, a garment shows who you are. It, it, it gives identity. How do you know what a police officer is? How do you know what a nurse is? How do you know uh, the position of people? Eric and them, they all wear orange uh, tops all the time, shirts. Now, I understood it, but if I remember he told me right, that's if they fall down in a holler, they can see them down there. And, uh, which is kind of, everybody says it's scary to be a nurse. Well, that's, that's scary to me, right? Uh, and it, it, it's significant. So they ripped him of who he was. They took everything from him. Now, but remember this. They didn't take it. He gave it. He gave it. And, and, and so we find that they ripped the, the garment off of him that, that was pleasant, that was, that, that was authoritative, that, that showed whom he was. And then verse 29, And when they had platted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed on his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail! King of the Jews. Now, I want you to notice two things there as well. Now, I don't know about y'all, but in my pasture, I have two thorn trees. And I hate those things. I told y'all about them the other day. I still haven't figured out what I'm going to do with them. But I wish they were somewhere else. Now, if you're not careful, when you go by a thorn tree, if you catch the bushes, and when I had that big mower, it had the, the roll bar on it. It was That roll bar was constantly <coughs> catching it. And it'd slap you in the head, and you know what? It would, it would, it would cut your head. I mean, it, it, it was very, very painful. Now, I don't know how the the thorns over in uh, Jerusalem is, but these are about that long, and and they they will get you. Now, I don't know what the Lord endured when it says it platted them. That's what we call breaking. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming they were on something more pliable, but I don't know. Uh, but I do know this. Blackberry bri briars are not something to be messed with either. You see what I'm saying? If, if it was something like that, you know what? It's still miserably painful. And they pushed it into his head, and then he began to bleed here as well. He did that on my behalf. He did that for you. Listen, church, we're bought with a price. Man. It, 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 it was, it was get, he had a miserable price to pay, and yet, and still, they paid it. The second part in this verse, part of the price they took from him, his dignity. Hail, King of the Jews. They were making fun of him. Sure. They, they had no sincerity in that. And remember, one week earlier, as he rode into the city, there were, uh, the Catholics call it Palm Sunday. They, they were putting the palms before him, creating a royal wall for him. See, we can think a, lot of, a whole lot of things in our mind, but if we're not convinced of the Holy Ghost, it, it don't mean a whole lot, does it? Right. And, and so we see then, now his dignity is ripped from him. He paid that for me. If you're saved, he paid that for you. He endured this for us. Then verse 30. And they spit upon him. That's, that's, if you study that, and I won't go into too deep on that, that, that was a Jewish thing. But if somebody spit on me, I'd be about ready to fight. Now that made me go back to the American pride. But spitting in the Jewish culture was something uh, that actually happened a lot more common. It, it, it was for the, 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 
the lowest class people there were. It, 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 was, it was really reserved for the Gentiles, for people who were non-Jews, people that they hated, especially despised. So we see also he's giving up his position. You know why Gentiles can be saved for this right here? Because he poured it all out. Because he did everything. They took his position. They took his, uh, his uh, everything who he was. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him in the head. Now, I'm assuming they, that means they took this thing that he was using as a chalice or as a, they were pretending that he had a ruler. You know, recently King Charles was inaugurated and they're given a golden, uh, like almost looks like a club to hold. And so they took that from him and whammed him in the head with it. You know, your, your head is one of the most sensitive parts of your body. That's why it hurts so bad when uh, someone pulls your hair. You know, uh, you ever had your hair pulled? Unfortunately, mine's been long enough to pull. <coughs> and y'all all remember Judy. She, one of the many people that talked me into growing my hair out. But we were fighting one day. And when I say fighting, we were literally fighting. It, it wasn't arguing back and forth. We fought. She wrapped her hand in my hair and slammed me on the ground. I tell you what, that hurt. That hurt really, really bad. And so when he was smote upon the head, we can't, we can't really get a hold of the pain that he endured. Now, as I've gotten older and I've had a beard for years, what I found out pulling this hurts more than pulling this. And have you ever read the, the 22nd Psalm? Not, not the one everybody knows, the one before that. It said that his beard was plucked out. Now I've never had my hair pulled, pulled hard enough to be pulled out, but I know that it can happen. Can you imagine your facial hair being pulled so hard that they pulled it out? And you say, well, that's not recorded. Well, that don't mean it didn't happen. The psalm was, you read that 22nd psalm, everything that that psalmist predicted happened. So I have to believe for whatever reason, maybe how horrific it was, Matthew just left it out. You ever seen so, something so horrific you don't even remember it? You don't even want to remember it, much less write it down. And, and, and so we see that that's exactly what he endured. That is your purchase price. You know, when we go through Walmart in the, uh, in the modern day and, and we scan something because they're too lazy to check us out, and, and we scan it, and, and in that little screen it pops up how much it costs. That's what it costs. For you to be redeemed and enjoy a relationship with the almighty God, Jehovah of heaven, this was your purchase price. This is what it costs. And they, verse 31, and after that they mocked him and took the robe off of him and put on his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. Now, that will, again, that's why I say some things may have been left out what they thought would be for our benefit and maybe they thought we would always understand what a crucifixion was about but see the crucifixion was this we've all seen the cross how it is and, and you know has it ever occurred to you before this happened years during his early ministry what was his advice to his disciples take up your cross and follow me. You know what that says to me? And we talked about how we're pilgrims and strangers always in this earth. Very recently I preached on that. And you know what? That means there's always a cross to bear. And you know why? Because he says, pick it up. Take up your cross and follow me. Now, if we're slaves, 
Is there any, is there any uh, way out on that one? No. We're to take up the cross. And I don't know what your cross is. My, my cross has been preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, among many other things. Uh, I love my children dearly, always, to the day I give up my last breath. But you know what? There is work with children. You have to get up out of that bed and go to work and have some food on that table for them kids. You know what I'm saying? It's a cross to bear. Uh, I do it lovingly and I do it willingly. Sometimes I wish huh, I served the Lord like I did trying to put food on that table. Right? And, and so we see then as the Lord's people that we there was a horrific price. Nail. And everybody's seen the cross and as far as I know that's pretty accurate. And literally a nail going through your hand. Now I've heard two schools of thought on that. One is this, that actually, and you know, you can't trust the Catholic Church, so it may be right. The Catholic Church always says right here, and it does say the palm of the hand. The Bible does say that. And then the other thing says they were really put right here, but that's what uh, Roman history teaches, uh, because this would have ripped through. And I've seen people cut like this, so I know that it's a reality. But, you know what? That little prong didn't hold him up there. My sin did. If it's against the belief uh, of a natural body that that could happen, listen, we don't need a natural body because he was doing that. My, uh, my sin, they, they didn't need nails. It was me. It was me. And so we find, and then when you raise them up, Death comes by smothering or asphyxiation. It is not ordinarily, now with Christ it was, but it is not ordinarily a bleed to death. Death it is asphyxiation because you can't breathe when you're like this. You can only get so much in. And many of them would pull up and get a deep breath and go back down. But eventually their body tired out and they would literally suffocate from the position they were in. That was the cruelty of the Romans. That's verse 32. Verse 33, and when they were come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to mingled with gall, and when he tasted thereof, he would not drink. Now the reason of that, it wasn't because it tasted bad, it was because it was a little, maybe the only compassion the Roman government had, it was just a little bit of anesthesis, a little bit to take the edge off. Uh, and, and, and the reason he refused that is because of me. He had to buy me, and buying me was taking the full price, paying everything. And so he did it. Verse 35, and they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be spoken, which was spoken by the prophet, that they parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture they cast lots. That's also in Psalms 22. And sitting down, they watched him there. Hmm. You, any, you ever watched anybody die? I, I've watched many, many people die. And thank God, the majority of the time, they died comfortably. Uh, sometimes, unlike the Lord Jesus Christ, we give them medicine so that they don't fight against what's happening to them. And the worst ones to watch die that's not the elderly and in, in for infants. The, the worst people to watch die is the young. I took care of a man who was dying with AIDS over in Camden, Tennessee years ago when I worked hospice. First time he met me, he said, Lafferty? I said, yes, sir. You ain't kin to James Lafferty, are you? I said, uh, I want to say, why do you want to know? 
But I said, yes, I am. That's my brother. We was in boot camp together. And uh, we had a conversation about that. And no, he wasn't a sodomite. He, he got AIDS doing like this. And he died. One of the most sad deaths I ever watched. At that time, he may have been 32 or 33, I'm trying to think how old I was to know how old James was, but I'd say 32. And you know what? He went out to eternity. He died. He, he was consumed. It was one of the saddest deaths I ever watched. Two things, I, I don't know what, he says he was a saved man and I pray the Lord he was. But I didn't know his spiritual condition. And, and the worst thing is, he died without a purpose. He got on drugs after he only served two years. He got out and, and, and got on drugs and listen, that was it. But thanks be to God, our Lord Jesus' death at 33, it wasn't without purpose. It had a great design and it had a great purpose. And that was the purchase of the souls that belonged to him. Right. But death is hard to watch, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So they sat back and they were watching. You know what? After 30 years as a nurse, I still don't like to watch people die. But this bloodthirsty bunch here, apparently they did. Because they sat back to watch it. Verse 37, and they set over his head his accusation written, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Now, if you remember in the gospel of Luke, remember what the Jews said? They said, uh, Pilate changed that to where he said, I said, I am the king of the Jews. And he said, what I've written, I've written. So, you know what? He was recognized whether they liked it or not. Right. He, and, and I think also in gospel, the Gospel of John, it says it was written in three languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And that's what, you know what? Everybody could understand. Right. That, that's why it was written that way. And, and so we see then that <laughs> this is the minuscule amount of respect that he was shown on this occasion. Then who he's grouped with, verse 38, and there and there then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left, and they passed by, and they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. <laughs> now, do you think it's just perchance that the invitation of the depraved was to come down from the cross? Now, a lot of people say that the devil had a victory dance after Christ died. No, 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 no. He knew it was up. And you know what? He even got more worried whenever he was resurrected on the third day. He, he, he knew the gig was up. So these ungodly people, their invitation to come down was a part of Satan's workshop. Because if he, had, if he had come down in any moment of that, my sins would not have been paid for, nor would have yours. Right. So this invitation was no doubt offered by Satan himself. And you know what? Have you been ever been hurting and you just so bad wanted to be easy? Could you imagine that, that that the mighty God of heaven hanging on the cross and an invitation to use his endless power just to come down? And you know, he had all that power. He did. You remember in the just earlier in the Gospel of John when he said, who seek ye? And they all fell backwards. That was the strength of the Almighty Jesus. So could he come down, you betcha. The invitation, you know what? In his flesh, it probably sounded good. 
but he knew it could not be. And that was because of me and my sin, and if you're saved, you and your sin, because he knew it had to be paid for. Verse 41, likewise also the chief priest mocking him with the scribes and the elders said, <laughs> he saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same at his uh, same in his teeth. Now, let me pause here to say, and the other three gospels, <coughs> at least Mark and Luke, <coughs> this boy was saved. Amen. Remember what he said? Lord, remember me when thou yes, comest right. to Amen. thy kingdom. He didn't say a sinner's prayer, did he? Remember me when thou comest. And, and you know what Jesus said? <laughs> Today thou will be with me in there. <coughs> you see, that atonement, what he was doing, even accomplished that in that in that thief's heart, even then, all of the blood given. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness upon all the land until the ninth hour, three hours. Uh, not even, and you know how in in the in the book of Exodus, and it, it talks about those three days of darkness that was sent, and, and it describes it as a darkness that could be felt. That's probably this type of darkness, something so horrific. And you say, well, what is that? That's the Almighty Jehovah <coughs> withdrawing Himself. How was the world before it was created? Darkness. For the first act of creation, let there be light. And you know why? Because it was a darkness that could be felt. And, and in the same way here, this darkness was so utterly dark. You know what? If I, 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 at least, I think even in the flesh, that had got my attention, don't you? Here a few years ago, we had a, uh, I guess it was a total eclipse, I don't know, and, uh, uh, apparently Hopkinsville people were written out of their bedrooms in Hopkinsville so people could see the eclipse and uh, uh, mother wanted to come down to the house because it was closer to Hopkinsville than her house and we all sat there on the porch we got our little special glasses on and we uh, me and Sarah and mama watched the eclipse and you know it, it's funny how people react to that Mama's most amazed thing about the only eclipse that I guess she saw in the majority of her life was that the chickens went to roost. Well. And you know what? That's how dark it was. And that was this darkness. Do you think sometimes we live in a wicked, wicked, wicked generation? Well, you ain't seen nothing yet. That's right. When God withdraws himself, and he will, according to the word of God, in those seven years, he'll withdraw his presence. And there'll be nothing like it that's ever been. A dark, you know, dear friend, that you're lost. You're in a darkness that can be felt. If you've not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and he's not saved your soul, you're in a darkness that's consuming in this kind of darkness. You need to trust him even today. What a glorious, glorious sacrifice. Now about the ninth hour, that was after these three hours of darkness. Now about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice and said, Eli, Eli, Sabathani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Answer that question. It was me and you. That's why God forsook it. It was my sin and your sin. That, that, that's the answer to that question. Some of them that stood by there when they heard that said, this man calleth for Elias or Elisha. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and held it up on a reed and gave him to drink. And the rest said, let be. Now, let be. 
Let us see whether Elisha will come to him, to save him. And Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Now, if you mark in your Bible, underline yielded, because that means he, and, and uh, Luke's gospel actually says he gave up the ghost. Now, this is the reality that might not sit well with you this morning. You're not going to give up your ghost. It's going to be taken. <laughs> yeah. Amen. We're going to die the usual death, right? I don't know if it'll be my seizure condition, if it'll be pneumonia, if it'll be dementia, or what will get me, but you know what? Something's going to get me. And it's going to take my ghost. <laughs> it's going to take my life's blood. It's going to, and I, I, I'll be... I'll be as dead as graveyard dead. But here it says the only individual that ever did it. He gave up the ghost. And you know why he gave it up? For me. He gave it up for you too if you're saved. Mm -hmm. he, <laughs> he tasted death. Spiritual death. Now I'm going to look at fleshly death one day and I'm not the picture of health, you know. And I'm going to taste, I'm going to taste spiritual death. I mean, I'm going to taste fleshly death, but one thing I will not have to endure because of this, I will not have to endure spiritual death. That's right. I will not hear those dreaded words, depart from me, you yeah. worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Am I? I'll never have to hear. You know, these people that, that believe in works type salvation. You know what? I dread how that scale weighed out, wouldn't you? I don't have to worry about that. Every price was paid more than 2,000 years ago. You know what I'm going to have here on the merit of Christ? Not on myself, but on the merit of Christ. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye in into the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. What a glorious thing. What an impossible price. He paid for us. Should we not serve him?